When I made my video on Kaizo Mario ROM hacks a few months back, I didn't expect to revisit the subject here on Snowman Gaming. Don't get me wrong, I've still been playing lots of them in my free time and having a blast improving my skill, but I thought I'd said everything I wanted to about the genre. And then I played through a hack that was simply so well designed that I had to bring it into the spotlight. Invictus, made by Juzcook in 2018, is easily the best Kaizo experience I've had so far, and despite being a one-man project, is a perfect example for prospective game designers on how to introduce new elements to the player. You see, Invictus prides itself on being a chocolate hack which means it adds a ton of wacky ideas and mechanics that aren't in the vanilla SMW engine. But unlike other Kaizo games where you're thrown into the deep end without any guidance, if Mario were suddenly a franchise known for being brutally difficult, you might think this one was made by Nintendo itself. There are a lot of things to commend Invictus for, like its great use of aesthetics, from little tufts of grass or Koopas and coats in the ice level, to just the right amount of custom scenery to feel new and familiar at the same time. Using Kamek as the final boss is fantastic. It's something we haven't really seen before, or at least not to this intensity. Holy crap! Or how it never uses hidden coin blocks to troll the player, but still causes many frustrating deaths with these flying coin blocks instead, which is somehow more annoying because you saw them coming and still fell into the trap. Actually, there is a single hidden block at the very last jump of the game, which is just hilariously diabolical enough to get off the hook. But above all else, it was simply the game's level design that stuck with me after my playthrough. Every single stage implements a new mechanic to keep things fresh, and they follow the same basic structure of introducing it safely, expanding it and building in difficulty, and then wrapping up with something not quite so challenging, which is genius, because it leaves just enough room to breathe to make the player second guess themselves, and often end up with a self-troll or psych out. It is absolutely true to its Kaizo roots, but has an extra layer of polish on top that a lot of Mario Maker creators or even other ROM hackers often overlook. There's no need for an abundance of arrows and indicators here because the layout speaks for itself. This all culminates in what I feel is a perfect final stage, but to truly appreciate that you need to see how the whole game builds upon itself piece by piece. So let's break it down. Piranha Pipeway is the closest thing this game has to a basic Mario stage, but right from the very first jump it catches you off guard with these platforms that move upward instead of falling down, as well as red dotted invisible blocks which both become staples throughout the hack. There's also this end piece that shoots out of a moving snake block, and unlike other platforms this one doesn't carry you along with it. Lots of things here that teach you not to always trust your past Mario knowledge. It's also worth mentioning that every stage utilizes swapping between regular and spin jumps quickly to proceed, and this is very important later on, we'll come back to this. Scorched Earth introduces snake blocks that can change direction or speed up and slow down with the plus and minus triggers, and plays around with these in many different ways. It's also the first time you see a flying coin block used as a troll, ouch that one hurt. I also love these bookends of making sure you know how to slide through bouncing rocks just after the midway, then finishing the stage with a combination of both elements. Feels good man. One by One shows off these rocket platforms that launch you high into the air, as well as the fact that keys can be used for more than just secret exits. This doesn't really make a return or anything, but I just love this screen. Just Cook dubbed it the Clock Room. Single screen puzzles do come back in a later stage though. Put a pin here. Built to Fall is sort of the first major test as there's no midway checkpoint and it's a particularly input heavy stage. This teaches about sideways moving thwomps in addition to vertical ones, and these see-through note blocks that bounce sprites back toward the sky. I got stuck here for a long time, but understanding how these thwomps operate is important because they come back often. The boss fight is neat because the on-off blocks used for safety move every time you jump. This isn't quite like how they make a return later, but it's still a great way to introduce the idea of switching back and forth at your command. Stick with me, this will all come together near the end, I promise. 
Plumber's Nightmare is great. These little pipes make for some really clever puzzles. And it combines all that nuance with elements you already know, like those upward moving platforms and multi-directional thwomps. It also uses a key as a platform to get through a hole instead of a secret exit. Man, those are versatile. The trolls at the end here are also particularly brutal. You start to realize this game loves to punish if you hesitate. Just trust your instincts and you won't get humiliated. Claustrophobia highlights the return of single screen puzzles, and also shows you that on off switches aren't always helpful. They can spawn in death blocks as well. This is a good test of what you know so far, and a nice shorter break from the Kaizo mayhem of other stages. Die Tree puts a cool spin on the typical vine chasing stage by adding in vertical scrolling to jump from one end of the screen to the other. If you were explorative back in the stage Sewer Smashin, however, you would have already seen this mechanic, as well as a neat test using those upward platforms again. Now, a Frostbite is a particularly cool level, and not just because it has these adorable penguins that act like moving note blocks, but they are cute though. It starts with this unique section where you have to bounce on a shell being kicked multiple times while waiting for the wall to disappear, and eventually highlights the return of that crafty snake block end piece. But now with the added challenge of ice physics. Old dog, new tricks, clever stuff. I like Rise Again because you gain a double jump, which lends to some clever puzzles of clearing obstacles in ways that would normally be impossible. But on top of this, it calls back to the overall theme of switching between normal and spin jumps. Now you can do them whenever you'd like in midair, albeit only one time. This is further training you for the big reveal. Just a little bit longer, hang on. Biohazard is where you really start to see the game testing you on your previous knowledge. It introduces horizontal scrolling for the first time, which is mind-bending enough, but it also combines all sorts of past mechanics like those rocket jumps and layer 2 walls from Sewer Smashin'. I mean, look at this final section, it's just incredible to see. This is another good reminder about how you don't need to overuse indicators unless it's absolutely necessary. Here with the buzzsaw, it's super disorienting to look at the top and bottom of the screen so quickly, so he added some arrows for guidance, but other than that, the level design does the talking. Alright, into the final stretch. Kamek Woods has probably the best flow of the whole game. It serves as some good foreshadowing of the final boss by turning him into a hazard to avoid, but combines it with these beetles from Mario 3 in the second half, and is a great example of how to make an auto-scroller more interesting. There's always something to do, even when you're technically waiting for the next big jump. Also a good reminder in the final screen that aesthetic can go a long way here. It doesn't just have to be background decor, it feels like you stepped right into these beetles' home. Good stuff. Okay, Stellar, the first of three levels that add up to our triumphant final challenge. Here you're able to switch on and off blocks with the L and R buttons. So kind of like that Reznor boss fight, but with more control. And for the most part, it keeps the regular obstacles to a minimum so that you can get used to using more buttons. It still does some clever things like the troll at the very end, that'll make your heart skip a beat, but it's mainly getting your feet wet in the chaos soon to come. The next stage, Absolute Power, is without a doubt the hardest in the entire game. It unlocks motor skills, which means you can officially switch between regular and spin jumps at will, anytime you'd like. All that buildup throughout the hack is finally paying off, because not only is this hard to get used to on its own, but the level doesn't hold back either. This is entire sections with no safe ground and precise button presses to do re-grabs, spin jumps, and shell throws. By now it assumes you know what you're doing, and I need to emphasize that it looks much easier than it actually is to pull off. The final screen probably took me 6 plus hours alone. Interestingly enough, it takes a break before Kamek's castle with Koopa Road, which is a much more laid back stage even though it still has a lot going on. It's sort of like an ultra star level, the traditional penultimate challenge, but make sure to add some final clever combinations of old tricks, like timed out platforms bouncing on those note blocks to continue to be useful. There's no checkpoint here, and at the very end it introduces the one and only use of this bully from Mario 64. And if you're not prepared, it can definitely ruin your day. This is possibly the only enemy placement that could have been better implemented. There's very little time to react to its behavior, but that's a real small nitpick. Finally, we've reached Invictus, the titular last hurrah. And originally, I thought it was clever because it combined both the L and R block switching and motor skills. 
Yeah, that's right, a true final exam. But it's actually much more than that, too. This throws in everything you've learned up to this point. Up platforms, note blocks, sideways thwomps, horizontal scroll, waiting for the wall to disappear, shell jumps galore. This stage will test all your previous Kaizo knowledge in addition to all the chocolatey goodness that was introduced over the course of the game. Top it all off with a six phase final boss fight, including green shells that turn into disco shells, homing bullets that spawn fireballs, and the flyby Kamek attacks, and you have the most triumphant feeling when you finally overcome. I realized two things as I finished Invictus. One, that this was the single greatest gaming achievement that I've completed so far, and two, that if I can do it, anyone can. When I started this whole Kaizo journey, I thought it would be impossible to tackle these harder hacks without the use of save states. But with enough patience and determination, here we are, and I only have more to look forward to in the future. I know this may not appeal to everyone in terms of the difficulty, but I thought it had enough game design chops to still take as a lesson for future game creators. You don't need a big studio or years of experience to make sure your project is intuitive and prepares the player for the experience you lay out before them. It has just enough surprises to keep things interesting, but like many other platformers I've praised in the past, it gives the impression that it's on your side and wants you to succeed. The speaker boxes simply state the base information needed for each stage, and lets you loose to try and overcome on your own. But it makes sure you're not going to quit out of frustration due to lack of knowledge. The only one you have to blame is yourself. Well, except for that final Kaizo block, I mean, that one was a real jerk move, man. Like, how do you. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I know it's been a while since our last video, and I apologize for that. With everything going on from COVID and a baby that's becoming increasingly mobile, I have a lot less time for videos than I'd like at the moment. But uh, fear not, I'm always thinking and working on stuff for the future, though perhaps a bit slower than I'd like. I can't thank you enough for your continued support despite that, and I hope to see you in our next video real soon. Quickly, I wanted to make one small plug for my Kaizo hack Snowman's Land. I've taken a ton of feedback from other players and improved basically every stage. Now there's a new final boss and collectible hidden coins in each level. It looks totally different from before, and I'd love for you to check it out if you're interested. Link is in the description below. I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty, my friends.